you have your Bibles, would you please turn to begin with to the book of James this morning? And we will go there. If you want to hold your finger in Colossians, we will be there as well. I appreciate you taking time this morning uh, to, to come to First Baptist Church to worship with us. We're looking forward to what God will do in a powerful, wonderful way. We had a lesson on stewardship this morning. We'll have a, a sermon now about our theme, Rooted in Him, and then we'll head down to have a banquet, stewardship banquet. And I hope you stay around. Whether you're a member or not a member here, you're welcome to stay today. Whether you put one dime ever in the offering plate is not a requirement. You come and be blessed. It'll be a great meal. Pastor Scott has been working and many other volunteers this morning diligent, diligently to prepare that for us. And it is not lost on me that we will eat when I get done. It's probably not lost on you that we will eat when I get done. The more you interact, the quicker I'll be done. That's terrible. We sing about Jesus, no one says amen. Sing about love of God, we sing, we talk about food, and all of a sudden we get everyone locked in on the same page. Mm -hmm, look at that. Yes, yes. Those who are guided by their bellies. I'm going to change my message this morning. Yes, I am. No. Listen, I'm glad you're here. I'm always glad to be among friends here at First Baptist Church. I'm glad for what God is doing and what he wants to do today and this year. I'm praying that God will do a powerful work at First Baptist Church this year. I'm praying that God will grow the church. That means not just new people coming. That means that everyone who comes will grow spiritually. That your walk with God will be greater because of your time here in and around the church and around the Lord this year at the end of 2023 than when it began. I want us to be able to look back and say, listen, this year I am closer to Jesus Christ. This year I have a better walk with Jesus Christ. This year I trust more in Jesus Christ. This year I'm a better steward for Jesus Christ. At the end of this year, everything we have and are and will be will be better because of Jesus Christ. I'm praying that we will grow this year at First Baptist Church. Part of that involves being rooted in Jesus Christ. That's our theme this year, rooted in him. This morning I want to again focus on an aspect of what it looks like and means to be rooted in Jesus Christ. In the book of James, if you have your Bibles opened there, look down please in verse number 8. We find this verse, and James has been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. James, throughout his book, will bring many practical sayings and statements some with context, some just uh, standalone thoughts. But here in James chapter 1, verse number 8, he says that a double-minded man is unstable. He's unstable. Double-minded man is not secure. A double-minded man has no steadfastness. A double-minded man is tossed to and fro, tossed every which way. A double-minded man, James says, is unstable. If you look at your Bible, what does the end of the verse say? In all his ways. A little phrase is a devastating phrase because it's true. It's true. We somehow are deceived that we can compartmentalize life. That I don't have to involve Jesus Christ in all of my life. I can compartmentalize him. And he's good for Sunday and he's good for my children. But he may not be good for my finances. He may not be good for my attitude at work. He may not be good for my relationship with my son or my mother-in-law my friend, we compartmentalize. We pick and choose where to place our loyalty, where to place our foundation. When James teaches us here about being double-minded, the concept here is that someone who is on both sides of the fence, someone who wants to straddle this concept of the Lord and not the Lord, in faith and no faith, of trusting God and not trusting God, relying on him and not relying on him, someone who wants to straddle this fence will be unstable, not just at church, and not just at home, and not just at work, and not just in their finances, but in every single aspect of their life, they will be unstable. 
I didn't make it up. It's what the Bible says. To contrast that, would you turn to Psalm chapter 1? Some of you already know exactly what I'm going to read to you. Some of you have already connected the dots. In Psalm chapter 1, we have a different look. A man who has, in verse number 2, made his delight in God, in the law of the Lord. Now that little phrase, law of the Lord, is, captures me when I read it, and I know it, because I know it to include the whole Bible. Includes from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, someone who is captured, who is enraptured, who meditates there and day and night. That shows someone who is enveloped in the Word of God. But to be very technical, to be very technical, what the psalm writer has given to us is someone who loves the law of the Lord. If we were to take the time, we could turn to Deuteronomy, where you'd find the law of the Lord, and you could read those laws line upon line. Precept upon precept. I don't know about you, but in my Bible reading, there are certain passages that I really look forward to. And other ones that I know that are going to be a little more technical in reading and application. Deuteronomy, Leviticus are great books. But when I come, when I come to the Gospels, read about Jesus Christ, I get really excited. But the psalm writer here says, listen, I love God so much and this, this man is in such love with the Lord in his way, it's with his way, that every bit of it he wants. He wants every bit of it. He wants to be rooted in it. The Bible says this in Psalm chapter 1, verse number 3, the last phrase. And whatsoever he doeth at home, at work, at church, with his finances... Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. We have a contrast this morning. We have the man who is double-minded. And he suffers. We have the man who is founded. And he prospers. Turn, please. We'll find our text this morning in Colossians chapter number 2. We'll be in Colossians 2 and chapter 1 this morning. This morning I want to... Ask us this question, are you strengthened by Jesus Christ? Am I strengthened by Jesus Christ? Is it his strength that is sustaining me? Is it his strength that is enabling me? Is it his strength that is empowering me? And for some here, I hope you can say, yes, yeah, yeah, I'm here and Jesus Christ is whom I'm drawing my strength from. There will be others who will say, Pastor, I have no idea what you're even talking about. We'll look at this today. And there'll be some in the middle who will be like, I want to, but I just don't know if I'm not. And my friends, I can tell you this, when you're drawing strength from Jesus Christ, there is no doubt in your mind. If you don't know probably drawing strength from yourself. Colossians chapter 2, we find our text, the kind of that we've used for our theme this year. The Bible says in verse number 6, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Lord, I'd ask this morning that you would help us as we look at your word. We ask for your help because we need you to illuminate in our spirit this truth. Lord, would you make plain the idea from this passage in Colossians 1 about how to draw strength from you? Lord, would you make real to us today the powerful, overwhelming truth that you want to strengthen and enable and empower us? And Lord, I ask that if there are those here today who are not drawing strength from you, that today 
they would commit their life in that way to you. They would cease from being double-minded and unstable and become founded. And Lord, I pray this morning if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that Lord, you would touch their heart. Even now, begin to work and Lord, show them what a good God you are. And Lord, I pray that today that they would trust you as their Savior. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. We ask for your help and I ask and beg for your assistance. Lord, your power now, in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We live in a culture, we live in a world with philosophy and science where there are a number of things that are unfounded. Meaning without a foundation or out something secure underneath it or without strength. An ideal will be presented up here that will have no foundational thought for it. Not to step on anyone's toes, but it always amazes me that people still think the earth is flat. The flat earth theory is unfounded. Yet, we live in a time that many things, many things are claimed and said and believed And they're based upon things with no strength, no strong foundation. When you come to church here at First Baptist Church, I don't want you to believe in Jesus just because I said you ought to. I don't want you to believe in Jesus because you think it's a good idea. I want you to believe in Jesus because you can know that he is trustworthy. He is strength and and he is a strong foundation. You can rest in him. You can trust in him. You can depend upon him. You don't have to be double-minded and unstable, but you can embrace him and be enraptured by him. There is strength there. To be unfounded in a storm means that when a wave comes or wind comes, you'll be swept away by another force. To be unfounded in a scientific sense means that what you're saying cannot be supported by experiment or by fact. To be unfounded in a building means that when something happens, the building will probably collapse. To be unfounded in an accusation means that what you're saying is baseless. You've made it up. You have no data or authentic truth to support your baseless, unfounded accusation. But to be unfounded in life means that you have based your life's goals, your decisions, your actions, your dreams, your future on that which may or may not be true. And we live in a world where people have based their life on something that is unsecure. And this morning, I want to look at the scripture. Because the Bible tells us that we can base our foundation, we can be rooted in something that is secure. Something that is strong. When you're unfounded in life, it means that you'll be swept away by the storms and troubles of life. To be unfounded in life means that your life can collapse at a moment's notice. To be unfounded in life means that you're open to the accusations of the wicked one and to the doubt that he can bring. In this passage, we find Paul's instruction to be rooted and built up in Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles open, I'd like you to, to look back in Colossians chapter number one, where Paul will begin to kind of open up this thought about kind of a context, what it looks like to be strengthened by Jesus Christ. Verse number 10 of Colossians 1, Paul says this, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. He's saying, listen, I want you to live a life that pleases God unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Don't miss this. Knowing God will help you be strengthened in God. Verse number 11, strengthened with all might. This word strengthened has the idea, not not that we have grabbed on, but that we have allowed something to grab onto us. 
Not that we are holding on to Jesus, though that concept will be found other places where we can cling to him. But this word strengthened, when I am strengthened with his might, it is a passive action. Something is happening in and through me, and I am, here it is, allowing myself. I am not resisting the strength of God in my life. You see, once we are saved, once we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, to be saved means to believe in Jesus to believe that he is the son of God. He is who he says he is. That he did what he says he did, that is to die on the cross, to forgive the sins of mankind. To believe in Jesus is to believe not only that he is who he says he is, that he did what he said he did, but that he will do what he says he will do. That if I ask him for forgiveness, he will save me. Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. The thief on the cross who had no way to do any good deeds, no way to give any money to the church, no way to offer any kind of life for Jesus, asked for help and forgiveness, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. No one who has come to Jesus has been turned away. And the moment that we trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, but as many as believe him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. When you see that word power in your New Testament, you can know that the, the Greek word behind it is dunamis, or we get our word dynamite. Dynamite has some power. They say, well, pastor, I like C4. Wonderful. But I tell you what, dynamite's got some power. The Bible tells us that when we accept Jesus Christ, we've got some power. We've got the power. Beyond that, the Bible teaches us that when we are saved, that the Holy Spirit, all right, part of, the, of God, the three parts of God, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, he will come and live and inhabit those Christians. So we have the strength of Jesus, the strength of God in the life of a believer. And we ought to be strengthened by his might. Now, the problem is not whether there is power or no power. It is not whether Jesus can give us the strength that we need. It's not whether he's inside of us or not. The problem is whether we're allowing him to strengthen us or whether we're stopping it. How do we stop it? We stop it when we don't listen to him. We stop it when we don't rely upon him. We stop it when we resist his leading, and reject his teaching and word. We stop it when we're content to live our life in our own logic and make our own decisions. I don't need Jesus' thought. I can do it myself. You see, when you find yourself just running to Jesus for every problem and then running back to yourself, you're not strengthened by Jesus. You're strengthened by yourself and you're asking Jesus for a bailout. Now, thankfully... I have a God who loves bailing people out. Parents, have you ever had a child ignore your instruction and look for a bailout? Shake him or rattle him. Yeah, we've had that. Hey, it's not going to work. Not going to work. Not going to work. Help me, Dad. Really? How could two such intelligent people have three kids? Most oft repeated phrase of the Howell House. There they are looking for a bailout. And what do we do as good parents? Of course we help them. What does our loving Heavenly Father do? Of course he helps us. We see that throughout the pages of the Bible that God says, you may go your own path and reject me, I'll still help you. But to be strengthened by Jesus is not just running every time for a bailout. It is to be consistently, regularly resting in his word, in his way, having a life trying, seeking to follow his path. It is not just coming to church on Sunday. It's living for Jesus on Monday. It's not just putting some money in the plate to make him happy. It's to live my life to please him, to love his law, like Psalm chapter 1 says, to not be double-minded and to be torn. That is to be strengthened by Jesus Christ. In fact, in Colossians 2 verse 7, it talks about being rooted. It means, that, it means as a root that I am gaining that source. I'm gaining all those things I need from Jesus Christ. They tell me that there are trees that can move water from the very bottom to the very top, hundreds of feet off the ground, all off little roots. 
The Bible commands us, challenges us to be rooted in Jesus Christ. This passage, Colossians chapter 1, I want to give us just three quick thoughts this morning. What happens when we find our strength in Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus gave an illustration about two men, two houses, one on rock, one on sand. Both buffeted and pelted with rain, one stood and one collapsed. James says, there's a man who's single-minded, there's a double-minded man, he's unstable. Psalm says that the single-minded man who's founded on God will prosper. Likewise, we have Christians who look the same Churchgoers, if you will, they dress the same. They live in the same neighborhood. They speak the same language. They carry the same Bible. They sing the same hymns and they sing with the same enthusiasm. But there's a distinct difference between the two because one internalizes and rests in Jesus Christ and one does their own thing. One will be strong and secure and strengthened and prosperous and one will always be unstable. One is strengthened and one is not. This morning, if you're honest with the Holy Spirit, you know where you're at. There will be some, like in any sermon, any message, when any truth from God's word is preached, that you will begin to argue in your mind. Well, this is why I'm strengthened. In a sense, answering me as I speak, you don't have to answer to me. I'm not God. You have to answer to him. So this morning, I'd ask us to check with the Holy Spirit. And ask him, are we strengthened in him? In 1 Colossians chapter 10 and 11, we find some things that take place, or verse number 11, we find some things that take place when we're strengthened by Jesus Christ. It says, strengthened with all his might, Colossians 1 verse 10, according to his glorious power, unto three things, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness. Let me give you three attributes of someone who has strengthened Jesus Christ. When someone has strengthened Jesus Christ, number one, they will, be, they, will, they will find strength and confidence. This first word, patience, is similar to long-suffering, but there's some subtle differences. This word, patience, has the idea that there is a confidence, there is a confidence and a hope that carries someone through even the darkest Nights. The young man, Christian, went to an older fellow in the church. He said, well, he said friend, would you pray with me that the Lord will give me patience? This older wise saint said, let's kneel down and pray right now. They begin to pray. The older saint began to pray for this younger saint and said, Lord, my friend here wants patience. I pray that you send some tribulation in his life this morning. And he continued, Lord, I pray that tonight... You'll send some tribulation in his life. I pray that tomorrow you'll send some. And by this time the young man said, hold on, hold on. I didn't ask for tribulation. I asked for patience. The wiser man, the wiser Christian said, listen. He said, in tribulation you will find your patience. You'll find your confidence. Not your own confidence, but the confidence of someone who is strengthened by Jesus Christ has. The confidence that says, boy, today is rough. Today stinks. Today is in no way, shape, or form do I want to repeat it ever again. Today is horrible, but God is still good. Amen. That's someone who's strengthened by the strength of Jesus Christ, by his might. In fact, later on in James, it says this, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. On our worst day, I think all of us would still say on our worst day, but I haven't had it as bad as Job. And to be transparent and honest, I don't want to. I don't want you to. I don't want that phone call from you or you from me. Just to be honest, transparent this morning. Right? But James says, he said, double-minded, later on he goes, you've heard of the patience of Job. How he had confidence. He had confidence inside of this time. Though he slay me, Job says, yet will I trust in him. That's someone who has their confidence, their strength coming from Jesus Christ. Someone who doesn't, 
What am I going to do? Oh, no. I've got a bill. Oh, no. I've lost this. Oh, no. Mark it down. That's someone who's not strengthened by Jesus Christ. That's someone who's been drawing strength from their own abilities. Hebrews says it this way. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. That's this word. The race that is set before us. Let us run with confidence. Confidence knowing that there is an end in sight. Confidence knowing that this race that we're called to will be just right for you and for me. Your race is slightly different than my race. We get the same ending with Jesus Christ, but when I'm called to run, my path in the race may be slightly different than your path. But I know that my race that God has called me to will be the right race for J.D. Howell. That I can run it with confidence, knowing that he is in control of my race. That is someone who has drawn strength and who is rooted in Jesus Christ. I love this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Strength and confidence. There's strength and confidence, but there's strength in endurance. That's that word for long-suffering. To long breathe hard. Technical way. You're huffing and puffing for a while. If you're running, you ran further than five feet. Long breathing for a while. We understand long suffering. We put up with things. We understand lack of long suffering. We don't put up with other things. The slow driver in the fast lane, long suffering goes out the window. The mother with a newborn child who's crying, long-suffering. You see, the only reason in life that we can breathe long or breathe hard for a long time, endure, it's not because of our own strength. We can't exercise ourselves that way. It's not because we have an inner resolve, not because we've trained our soul. It's not because we're naturally tougher. I detest that, I detest that phrase, God gives his hardest lessons to his toughest servants. It's baloney. It's a Greek word, by the way. The reason we can endure hardship is because we're rooted and founded and find strength in Jesus Christ. Because we're strengthened in his might and his power. In ancient Greece, there was a race. A race that was not for just the first one done. But it was a race where the runners would hold a torch. And they'd have to pass the lighted torch to the next one in their, in their group. And the team that crossed the finish line first with their lamp and torch still lit was the one that lit, was the one that won. You see, it's important to start the race. But it's really important to finish this race with our torch still lit. And we can endure because of Jesus Christ. And I see the third here. Not only is there strength in in confidence, there's strength in in endurance, but there's strength in joy with all joyfulness. Hebrews chapter 12 also says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The cross, was that the joy? The Bible says the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I believe the joy was fulfilling the plan of the Father. And and along the way, the plan brought some things that he had to endure. That's long-suffering, long-breathing hard. He had confidence in his trust in the Father. All right, he's God. But he had joy because he knew the end of the story. He knew the joy that would bring with the contradiction of sinners. And he'd find out, and he knew that salvation would be offered. Back in 2021, Miami, Florida, 
Miami Beach, there was a condo building that collapsed. The collapse of this condominium, it shocked the nation. And rescuers worked days at the Champlain Towers south and Surfside to try to find the survivors. In this tragedy of this condo that collapsed, where 98 people passed away. They begin to investigate in the wake of the collapse, the questions were being thrown. Why did this huge 12 story, 136 unit oceanfront condo building collapse? Same question sometimes that we ask in our life. How could that person, how could my life, this huge pinnacle, it looks so good on the outside? Why did it collapse? Why did it fall down? Why are there casualties? I'm going to find out. The final cause was that come from a combination of prolonged structural damage. Let me break it down in our language. There was a bad foundation. They found out the building was built on columns sunk into the ground. They built this whole building, 12 stories, and sold condos, people lived in them, on something that had no business being built on top of. And ultimately, it collapsed. My friends, when we don't plan ourselves on Jesus Christ, we aren't strengthened with his might. We are, in essence, building on top of sunken pillars, a shaky ground. And for a while, the building may look okay. For a while, there may be some sparkle and some shine to it. But it will ultimately, always collapse. It's inevitable. Because anything built on other than Jesus Christ is not solid. Anything strengthened by things other than Jesus Christ is not secure. And will always bring instability. So this morning, simple question. Are you being strengthened by Jesus Christ? Not if you look like you're being strengthened by Jesus Christ. Not if you can argue with me about that. Because again, I'm not the one you have to answer. But before the, the Savior, before the God of the universe, can you say, Lord, I'm operating, I'm living in your strength. If not, I have a wonderful God who when you call unto him, will hear you, answer. And if you're not strengthened by him today, commit to being strengthened by him. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you need his foundation. Lord.